Renee. Yo, yo, yo. We wait all week and all day for more. Saturdays with Renee. Yes. yes. And this time they don't have to wait for Saturday. That's true. Cause we are going to, cause this is a Patreon going, special going, for our patrons, right. at Patreon least initially. Special. Yes. And then we'll, it we'll work it out. I feel oh, no, like it's going to have to go out to the people sooner than later. Is, this is I about feel like we can't, yeah, we can't, we can't, we can't keep do that. this to ourselves. We can't, we just can't. That's not, it's not fair and it's also it, it is not it is not the it's not the course that we need to be on no 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 the, the current situation that we are surviving so we're just gonna we, it'll be a, a quick shout out to our patrons thank you very much for supporting us encourage others to join you and uh but then this will go out to everybody right away so that they can you know, more or less right away. So that, because this is a very important discussion. We, and, and we got to figure it out. We got to at least hold we'll it. Figure till, it out. We got to hold it till Saturday. We'll hold it till Saturday. And, and then, then we'll let people know to go. We, we'll tell yeah. the Patreons they have access and then we'll give it to everybody else next week sometime. Okay. Fair enough. There we go. Right on. All right. That's okay. the plan. That's the plan. <laughs> so, so who, who we, what, who do we have, who have you, this is this for me is kind of a coup because I've become I've become kind of a a, a, a political stand for our next guest. <laughs> Such a stand. Because and I don't even know if Dr. Hassan understands. He I like I don't even know if he I hope and I would I, hope not, because it's such an elevated with focus I, on so many more important things, but listen, but uh, uh, but I deeply right, so, appreciate our next guest, especially definitely. after being introduced uh, about a couple weeks ago, and and so this was this is great. So, so after after we were able to to have that wonderful conversation last week um, with Brother Ahmed, and we reached back out, he sent a very nice thank you, which why he was thanking us, given all of the bars he dropped on the show, I don't know, but. Since he opened himself up for further communication, I was like, can we get Dr. Hassan on, please? <laughs> Is that possible? And he was able to, to set it up. So why don't we go ahead and bring up Dr. Hassan? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining. We are super excited. <laughs> super excited to have you on. Um, Such a pleasure. So we, we, Jared and I um, have already confirmed that we are not supporting the Democratic Party. This was prior to any specific movement that was happening. Um, both Jared and I are actually Green Party, technically. Um, <laughs> we're probably going to have, we might have a different choice at the top of the ticket. We're still, you know, I don't want to put any pressure on you because I know that Abandon Harris is having conversations with third party candidates. Um, but we heard you speak on breakthrough news and you know you were just so absolutely spot on with why your stance is what it is and i thoroughly appreciated having a really good way to tell people what you're telling me about voting for harris is nonsense and this is why it's nonsense and so um we wanted to have you on to talk about really we have we have you for like 25 minutes now so like whatever whatever we can squeeze into that time i have a couple of things if we can squeeze it in to um to ask you about specifically but if you could can you just start with you and you know your your story and how this abandoned biden now harris came to be and then we can kind of go from there yeah, so in, in October, after the attacks took place, uh, we were sort of screaming the shout, cease fire now in the protests. And I became really concerned. I'm uh, 
been a professor of human rights strategy and movement making for many years. And what I was seeing was a recipe for being ignored. And I approached one of our leaders, um, the head of care Minnesota, where I live and in Minnesota, and he you know, expressed a lot of concern when I told him, I think that the only way the Democratic Party is going to actually listen to us is if we vowed never to vote again for them. As you probably know, Muslim Americans, Arab Americans vote in, in huge numbers for the Democratic Party and uh, 85 to 90 percent in the last cycle for Joe Biden. We came out in droves for him and there was a sense that these attacks would persist and we would have no ability, no leverage if we didn't effectively threaten the president with our withdrawal of support. And so we, we did exactly that on, on October 27th. We issued an ultimatum uh, calling on the president to call for a permanent ceasefire by October 31st, and he didn't. And so on November 1st, you'll see if anyone Googles the abandoned Biden signs, the launching of abandoned Biden throughout the country, particularly in swing states where we made the case that just a fraction of uh, of, a po of the population of people of conscience can deliver these states away from Biden. And then we moved into the primaries. We proved our strategy uh, was, was a logical one by demonstrating that we had all these folks who voted uncommitted in the Democratic primary. And then we turned to the encampments. And then finally, again, after the debate, we learned that Vice President Harris would be the candidate. And we called on her on July 22nd to just meet two demands. And then we would support her. A permanent ceasefire, permanent unconditional ceasefire, and a full arms embargo. The media took our message to the campaign and they said, no, we're not commenting, not interested, nothing to do with abandoned Biden. And that policy ultimatum lasted for one month, August 19th, a few feet away from the convention with Dr. Cornell West, Dr. Jill Stein, with Claudia de la Cruz in our company. We launched Abandon Harris. And uh, we did this with great grief. We wanted the vice president to say in her heart, she believed this was a genocide. She believed that the president was wrong that action had to be taken to stop Netanyahu and his reign of bombardments on an innocent people on the verge of disintegration. And instead, we started seeing evidence of a view no different than Biden, and even sometimes some people might even argue, demonstrating full-blown support for the Zionist regime, the autocracy in Israel. And that is that the Vice President rebuked protesters in Detroit and, and she said that I'm speaking. And all they were asking is for, the, you know, is for, for them to be listened to when it came to the question of genocide, that genocide was happening, that there was no way to hide from, the, from that genocide. And we learned that she didn't really want to speak with us. She wants her strategy is to be sympathetic, is to be kind, is to point out the deaths, but then simultaneously engage in that very policy, contributing to hundreds of thousands now who have been killed, maimed, injured, attacked, declared terrorists, even though they're the very people who are suffering. And so it became extremely clear to us. The question that the vice president should be asking is not, I'm speaking, but when will Gaza speak? When will these folks who have been silenced again and again, abandoned Biden, silenced after the launches in November, abandoned Biden, silenced during the primary, abandoned Biden, silenced, erected tents, people of courage side by side, speaking stories. Instead, we, met, we were met with arrests and disciplinary action. We called for the president to drop out, hoping for a replacement that can be a step forward a step beyond genocide and then we got vice president harris 
And of course, we learn she's supporting the military dominance of the state of Israel. And we have launched our campaign, Abandon Harris. Our goal is to ensure the defeat of the vice president in order to take credit for it to be remembered in history forever, that if you engage in genocide, you will lose. And that through this defeat, we can say that people of conscience will always defend those oppressed abroad, that we stand for civil rights, and that by demonstrating that we have the capacity to punish, which just requires 1% in the swing states to deliver these states away from Harris, we can then show a signal to the political landscape once and for all that genocide can never be on the ballot. And so we are expecting a reckoning in the Democratic Party and a reorientation in the Republican Party, a new spirit to emerge if we can show that we truly made the effort, that we stood our ground, and that the vice president, president lost at our own hands. I am here for all of that. <laughs> <laughs> all of that. Um, and we shared the press release that you all um, released uh, yesterday, I think it was actually released, um, telling people vote third party, which I was very excited to see. And I don't know how much of this you can share, if anything, but is is the intention to eventually endorse a third party candidate or will the line remain at just vote third party and do not support a genocidal candidate? No, we're, we're, we're looking very closely uh, at the different options. We happen actually to be part of a task force of different organizations, civil rights organizations, Muslim American organizations, and they have come up with a plan so that we can make a singular endorsement. And so we've been sworn to secrecy, uh, but they uh, have decided with the task force together, we decided that we would tell the American public about our decision uh, on the 16th of September. And so there, there is a sense of what the decision is, but we can't actually state it. We're still at the final stages, uh, but we're very excited. We, we feel like while we haven't uh, actually endorsed, we have made clear who our allies are. And we feel we have to reward them. We have to reward the people of courage, those politicians who operate in a political landscape that minimizes them, that degrades them, that goes out of their way to exclude them from attention. So people like Jill Stein and people like Cornel West and Claudia de la Cruz, and even folks uh, that might not be as well known, like the libertarian candidate, um, Chase Oliver, or anyone who has stood out and spoken about this genocide at risk of their own career, at their own reputation, we consider a hero. And so uh, we, we express great affection and we consider them comrades on this mission. It's emotional for us because in a world in which uh, you can feel despair, you come to realize that despite these images of attacks that are met with silence, there are people who at this very moment, despite the fact that they can be under attack, that they can suffer reputational damage, they speak the truth. And that's actually one of the things that I've come to truly admire. When I, in 2022, I was conducting research in occupied Palestine and Jerusalem, and uh, my research assistant and I, we called for the liberation of Palestine uh, during that year in 2022. And we put our message on YouTube, and eventually it led uh, to forces capturing us, a national alert was called for my capture and my research assistant's capture. I was I was heading towards the Al-Aqsa Masjid, which was the primary site of my research, where we knew some 20 to 40 youth were working with us. And they were, uh, the idea was for us to replicate the events of Tahrir Square in Egypt, where people came out nonviolently and spoke out against the autocracy of Hosni Mubarak. And throughout the Middle East, 
uh, there are all these autocrats that violate human rights uh, as as part like as everyday routine in 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 the country. Egypt became a torture machine and the people came out in 2011. And so we felt that this is an opportunity for people to learn about the experiences of the youth that we encountered in our research. People like Usayyid, who struggles with the fact that his father's in prison and doesn't know when he's going to be released. People like Imran, who, who I miss quite dearly um, and who struggles with wondering about whether I can get married, whether he can actually have children in a family because the occupation constantly chases him in his everyday life. Police brutality, being constantly stopped in the streets, being questioned when you buy a car, being scrutinized, everyone staring at you when you enter into a bank. And so uh, Sheikh Sami, uh, uh, walking the streets of Silwan adjacent to the old city, constantly getting entrapped by the police, even though all he does is ask people to do good. So we learn these stories and there I am, a human rights professor, a strategist, and we told them we can do a nonviolent protest that can be far more effective than many other types of strategies to bring the attention of the world into the glimmering city of Jerusalem under its golden domes where we strategized on the enclave of Al-Aqsa, even though there was an army of Israeli forces in the mosque wearing shoes. And under their noses, we strategized, but then it ended on December 1st, um, you know, heading towards Al-Aqsa Masjid uh, Mosque. And, and there was, you know, a guard and at every door there are guards. And one of these guards, you know, sort of ran towards me, seemingly excited. I, I was like taken aback because I'd go in and out again and again. Um, and I, I knew this man hated me. He hated seeing me with the youth. Uh, and there he was like scrolling on his phone. And, th and there was my photo. And there began a chapter of research unimaginable. Uh, my, my, my hands were handcuffed. My legs were, my, uh, were handcuffed. And just the coiling of that metallic cold deepening into my skin my clothing removed, I was naked, and all these Israeli forces around me paraded through the old city, thrown into a van, taken to the infamous Mescobeya prison, processed, blindfolded, claustrophobic, laces removed from my shoes, taken impatiently, dragged while I was tiptoeing, confused, not being able to see ahead of me, thrown into a dungeon cell, poorly lit, confined spaces, tortured, interrogated, in prison, my company, a toilet hole in the ground, its scent evident, stench, my heart rate increasing behind two metallic doors, the clanking of the keys, interrogation again and again, blindfold lifted, shouting in multiple languages, Hebrew, Arabic, English. Why are you here? What does it mean that you're trying to end the occupation? And when I, when I ended up coming back to America, one of the most extraordinary things is that people just keep, why, why doctor, did you do this? Are you, stu are you a fool? Like, how can you, did, you actually put your, your video on YouTube and you call for the liberation of Palestine for people to come peacefully and protest. And, um, and, and, and people constantly ask, you know, why did you speak out? And the real question, my dear brothers and sisters here, is how can we not speak out in a time of genocide? The demand on us so minimal in America, no torture will be set us no killing of our families, no demolition of our homes, no displacement from one city to the next, as is happening now in occupied Palestine. You can walk gently to the ballot box behind the curtain and vote the truth. And so we have a remarkable task ahead of us, a responsibility so great I cherish. Those who speak the truth, like Dr. Cornell West, Dr. Stein, the heroes 
here in this very channel, anyone who is speaking out is a gem of light and we can't underestimate it. When I was going through prison uh, and, and I, I met one of the youth and he asked me, what would I do if I made it back to America? And I didn't think I would because the interrogators were saying I was, I was going to stay here forever. But I replied, I'll speak out. And, and he amazingly had reflexively on his face a huge smile, a brilliant smile that even in the heat of his torture, this young early 20s, married, worried about his family, what brought him pleasure was that you here now would hear his story, that we would be telling his story, that we would be acting and trying to figure out a way to plan a strategy to overcome the despair that this planet is experiencing for us to witness genocide and to do nothing. And so the people around the world and here in Brother Faris, who I met in prison, one of the youth that we were working with, what brings him pleasure is not that the bombs end or that his house is not demolished or that the propaganda is terminated, that his smile comes by knowing that we're here talking, that we're just struggling to act. And the best action we can do now is to send a signal to the political landscape with our allies, African-Americans, Latinos, Gen Z, progressives, Muslim Americans, Jewish Americans, for it to be said in history that a small group of people walked gently to the ballot box and spoke the truth. Dear brothers and sisters, let me tell you that 21st American history is happening before our eyes. And in 10 years, professors and teachers in high school will begin to discuss what happened here today and what happened in the next six weeks. And those students will ask, why didn't more people vote against the vice president? Where were they? Don't be from the ones our children and our grandchildren will talk about in class with such disfavor and confusion. Be from those heroes that they will look upon as an example for the future of our country and our planet. Thank you for that. Uh, there's really not much to say. It's difficult to come up with words for that. I, I was, to be honest, I wanted to come back with some kind of joke about have you having gone through some political conversion after having seen the debate the other night and seeing the performance of, of, of Kamala Harris and felt emboldened now to support you. But, but it's, it's difficult to come up with a good way of, of, of phrasing it after hearing again, your, your story and your perspective. Uh, but I will just ask this very quickly and, and, and please add any other, uh, what I'm, uh, have to assume will be closing thoughts for this particular discussion. Uh, but after the debate, and after the this new wave of it, it feels like propaganda, but this 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 resurge this resurgence of support after what seemed to be this this strong performance by the vice president in the debate, and a lot of people are being re encouraged back into support for her. If you ha if you watch the debate, I don't know if you have any thoughts as to why what you what. So a lot of I'll just say this: what I've been, what I feel like I've been doing a lot in my classes, in particular after the debate, is explaining why what students heard was not the change that many of them hope or think that they they that they are getting with her. Uh, and so I was thinking of asking you, or trying to find a way of asking you, if you heard anything in that debate that that uh, is a reminder of why you have reached the conclusions you've reached the the i think quite accurate conclusions you've reached and i hope all that made sense Ab absolutely sense. absolutely and and i really commend the vice president uh intelligent sophisticated and eloquent capable of responding to questions vigorously uh highly skilled and one thing that everyone should recognize is that when it comes to human rights and to civil rights at Abandon Biden, we follow the light of Martin Luther King. 
our forefathers and foremothers, Rosa Parks, John Lewis, we feel fundamentally that autocracy is often advanced by those who speak a beautiful speech. Be fearful of those who present themselves with such skill and diligence as the vice president. And yet that skill is not matched with a rhetoric that condemns the clear violations of human rights reigning upon an innocent people. What's scary is this is exactly what Orwellian doublespeak is. And I warn everyone that someone so skilled, so capable that in the very moment with perfect grammar, without pausing, responding to questions unexpected and capable of delivering constant feedback and replies to the former president, that that's a person who knows exactly what's going on in occupied Palestine. This is a truly intelligent, capable person. There is no question about that. And what we should do is fear the autocrat who's capable, the autocrat who's intelligent, the autocrat who is eloquent. What will they do when they come into power and tell us and explain to us why the bombardments must continue? and why the displacements are inevitable. I'm sure she'll be incredibly capable to deliver the message of APAC to the entire country, but wrapped up in the American flag. And so be warned, as Martin Luther King warned us of the segregationists and those who had to speak out, the abolitionists who had to speak out at those who normalize slavery, that what we are seeing is eloquent speech and rhetoric that proves that she is fully aware that a genocide is taking place. And what happened? Very little was described, very little was said about Gaza, and people moved on. And so she should have taken the opportunity as a skilled person who loves and worries about an innocent people, who's concerned about the American people's future, who's concerned about the reputation of our country. She should have said sorry to the media. I'd like to say some things about Gaza. Please give me the opportunity. What we have been doing the past year is not my policy. I believe that a people must live in peace with their own land, free of occupation, and that all the armaments that we have sent are truly a mistake and that I will be turning the page and that we will look forward towards a peaceful Middle East in which different peoples can live in the same region, fulfilling the promise of protecting their children and grandchildren free of trauma and fear of nation that they can call their own. And so what we feel fundamentally is that the vice president is a person that deserves enormous rebuke and that we're morally obligated to stand and firmly articulate why the vice president must be rejected. And so the beauty that we see, the eloquence that we see is horrifying. I, I mean, that's what we've been saying. It's just bars. <laughs> it's yeah. just bars. No, that's, yeah, I just can't. Yeah. Um, and and I know we have to let you go. Unfortunately, I would hold you here as long as possible and just talk forever. And shout out to my mother who is gonna be thrilled to see you on the screen. She was that's already a, like, hey, I, <laughs> I, I love that. Yeah, send, oh. send my piece. And it's so, so amazing to connect with all of you. You don't understand Thank you. Thank what you. heroes we think of you coming every day, constantly, speaking the truth to the people, reminding them of the challenges ahead and how much our struggle just constantly is when we persist. We, we are learning from you, brother and sister. We, we're, we're all very new to this struggle. And for us, our, the people we look up to have come here and spoken out against lynching Ida Wells, 
who reminds us every day, you know, I constantly talk about, tells us to shine the truth upon wrong and upon genocide. And so we're just heartened and about the fact that we could come here and, and your hospitality and kindness, the, the urge you feel that we could sense at, at Abandon Biden and Abandon Harris, that you want for the nation to move forward. And so we commend you for us, your heroes. We award you the, uh, the heroism that we so seek to have in ourselves. I mean... I don't know if I deserve all that, but I'll I don't take think it. we, uh, yeah, that's a lot. But we, appre- <laughs> look, we appreciate the kind words. It. You're definitely welcome definitely. back anytime. At any we, time, yeah, anytime. Yeah. And I'm going to send you, if you don't mind, Dr. Hassan, uh, the New Jersey Uncommitted Group has decided to move forward with a No Votes for Genocide um, campaign. And I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but I'll send you the information for you all to take a look at what they've decided to do in New Jersey, which is where I'm, I'm stationed right now. And so- oh. Um, I, you know, I think, I think it's important for you to see kind of where some of the states have decided to make some different decisions than what that national campaign seems to have decided to do um, in hopes that, you know, we can all keep working together and pushing people to just say no to genocide because we, we cannot, we cannot accept it, not under any circumstance. Ab- absolutely. Yeah. And to talk about the uncommitted at the national level, I'm glad to hear about New Jersey. That's thrilling because we feel really that it is so critical this moment for people to vote against the vice president, against Donald Trump, that we must never side, never side with the criminals. And so uh, I, I say this with a lot of respect to the people we love and uncommitted, but now is the time to turn the page for us to clearly state, stipulate to the American people that our movement is to reject clearly the vice president and the former president. And I can tell you that there are so many people counting on us around the world to show our example. Uh, When I was in prison, I wanted the whole world to go upside down just because I experienced for the first time a taste of injustice. Imagine the people around the world subject to bombardment and victims declare terrorists, even though they're perpetually injured. And the so many in our country that have suffered uh, and we've reached a point where we can't, in honor of those who have struggled through the centuries in America, we can't simply turn a blind eye and we must bring civil rights into foreign policy. And Martin Luther King, the one we so dearly admire who walked on Selma, who wrote letters in Birmingham jail. Uh, We remember at Abandon Biden, the Martin Luther King who spoke out against the Vietnam War. Civil rights are not just for Americans, they're for all people. And so when I came back to America, I experienced a second trauma, the trauma of loneliness, of being tortured, and no one knew your vote is a memory. Your vote is evidence that you were present, that you were aware, that you thought and deliberated, that you were not an automaton approving of the media message and the media diet that imbibes you and compels you to vote for someone that you would naturally reject if your own family were subjected to the policies of this vice president. And so do not make the people of Palestine and around the world lonely by keeping them in despair, by not speaking out, but make them present because that smile on the face of the brother I saw behind bars in prison is the smile that will come on so many of the oppressed in our country and around the world when they know that your vote was decided because you found these attacks intolerable. And so I thank each of you for your generosity and for the moral making of voting and deciding to go behind the curtain and gently vote the truth on November 5th. Right on, Dr. Salam, thank you very much. Thank you. 
definitely look forward to having you back around and uh uh you know best wishes peace to you and yours and uh take care absolutely Thank you. both of you such a pleasure take care continue the amazing struggle dear brother and sister see you soon Thank right you. On. Peace right soon. on peace peace all right Dr. Hassan Abdel Salam. We'll put a link to his faculty webpage in the description and, of course, links to Abandon Harris so folks can follow up. And uh, Renee, great job. Shout out to you for, for pulling that together. That was Oof. incredibly I'm, I'm powerful. like, I, I'm done. I, I got nothing. I got nothing. So, all right, All right everybody. This is this is this was for you patrons, at least initially. Thank you very much for your continued support of Black Liberation Media and to those who will join you and see this later. Peace to you as well, as long as you're willing to fight for it. As Fred Hampton used to say, on behalf of Saturdays with Renee and Renee herself, we'll see you next time right here on Saturday with Renee. Renee.